Welcome to the Futures Forum Live Online, where we explore the landscape and byways of our shared futures. On this edition of the Futures Forum Live, we exchange ideas, information, education, and inspiration about the future of Black America. For more information, visit www.thefuturesforum.org. Get Futures Sense now. Share this story and share our future. Stay tuned for a journey to the future with host, Dr. Claire Nelson. Greetings and welcome to the Futures Forum Live, an online e-magazine of the Futures Forum. February is Black History Month in America, and we're having a conversation in this session on the future history of Black America. Specifically, we want to explore what life might be like for people of African descent in the United States of America in the year 2030 and beyond. Now, this is important to me because, number one, 2030 is a pull year. Nations around the world have pledged through UN Agenda 2030 to try to meet the Sustainable Development Goals, all 17 of them with 169 targets. And among those tar targets and goals is one around inequality. Now, with America, quote-unquote, fitting to be a majority-minority country, by 2030, it will be very interesting how the conversation around inequality might emerge. And with African Americans going to be the second to large minority, second largest minority in America, clearly there will be some very interesting shifts taking place. And so I wanted to have a conversation with somebody who is kind of very much engaged in watching the future and working with people who are writers and educators and artists. So, Describe that future. So, who do we have? We have William Jones, who is the founder of the Afrofuturism Network. Mr. Jones is an educator, a self-described geek, and what more? How else might he call himself? A historian, a public speaker, and a curator of what is being said about the image of Black people in America, at least, no, no, I think all around the world, in various forms of the media, pop culture, hip hop music, to name a few. He's been speaking a lot and certainly getting the word out about what that might look like. So, without further ado, let me say greetings to my new friend, William. How well, are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you. Well, thank you for taking time out of your schedule. Let's just jump right in. Afrofuturism, for those people who are not familiar with the term, what exactly is Afrofuturism? Well, the term itself was developed in the 90s um, by a journalist by the name of Derry. And basically what it looks at is, it looks at the role of black folks in the realms of science fiction, fantasy, uh, comic books, and things of that nature, and finding their place in it and the voice behind it as well. Now, even though the term had developed in the 1990s, Black people have been writing science fiction and talking about science fiction well before that. I mean, you got uh, all the way back, let's say W.E.B. Du Bois, even he was writing science fiction stories. He was wondering, pondering what black folk in the future would be like. So the, the, the idea of black people writing science fiction, being part of science fiction stories, has been around for a very long time. But in the 90s, the term itself was coined. Well, now, most of what I've seen in terms of science fiction um, for from a black writing perspective is the Octavia Bell um, series. No, Oct Octavia Butler, sorry, Octavia Butler series. And um, her science fiction uh, ranges between speculative and fantasy. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is that one of her series, I think, Parable of the Soa series, she sets her stories in Los Angeles in 2040 something, I believe, or 2030 something. You might be more aware of them than myself and she describes a somewhat dystopian future now as we are now not that far away from that date i'm wondering from your point of view um are you first of all seeing more people writing 
about um, that like near fiction um, and what are you seeing in the writing of what the future might emerge to be? Well, since I've gotten started with this, I've become uh, introduced to even more and more writers and more and more stories. And yes, they are dealing with questions of the future. And in many instances, quite frankly, it's not necessarily too bright. And I think they're basing that on the past as well as the present. So, you know, looking at where we've been, looking at our experiences in this country, for some of these writers, it may be difficult, understandably so, to kind of see uh, a necessarily positive future for Black folk. Many times, they will deal with issues of uh, government suppression, government oppression. They will continue to deal with, they will also look at Blacks, uh, Black people in the realms of technology and so forth, but there's a wide variety. But yeah, a lot of them, I think, because of the current conditions and you know conditions of the past, may not always have you know the brightest outlook for the future. But isn't that actually well? There's a, well, there are two ways to look at that. Number one, there's some people say that it's much easier to write a dystopian True. future. I mean, whoop to do. Right. Our brains are wired to think about things that we fear, right? right. So it's easier to craft a story about what could go wrong because we're wired that way, right? We're risk averse. So we're all looking for what could go wrong. So the question is, but there's also this conversation about self-fulfilling prophecy. Yes. So in terms of the real future, because um, this conversation is not about just uh, writing and speculative fiction, I really want to explore if we're trying to create a more equal society or a more equitable society, how might narrative and the narrative of science fiction and speculative fiction help us imagine how that could occur? Well, one of the things keep in mind, I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Because, because the question is, uh, this, uh, everybody likes to talk about the fact that Star Trek Pave the way for you know opening doors, automatic open doors, and tricord, and it's on its way soon. So, as a Trekkie, I'm a diehard Trekkie, I must have watched many episodes more than once. I, I, I could see how that could have been a precursor to what we're experiencing. So, here you have taken the time to create a body, a network of people who are uh, intentionally writing stories in form of art or comics or you know, storytellers. What is your take on the use then of this art form in beginning to imagine how we could actually create more what I call normatopia, meaning the, the, the space between a dystopia and a utopia on the other hand, and call it a normatopia. So we're not going to be all living and singing kumbaya, but we're not going to be living behind a zinc fence either. So how do you see that as a part of the struggle for justice? How do you see this writing and Afrofuturism as, as being active and intentional about supporting the struggle for economic and social justice? Yes, well, I think that uh, one of the things that usually you will find part of these stories is this idea of social responsibility on behalf of the creators. The idea that they have to relate and share some type of information with the readers. Now, the reason why science fiction and fantasy is great is because it allows you to tackle topics that may be controversial, but because you're placing it in a fantasy or science fiction type realm, it gives you the freedom to do it. And when people are reading it, they're more accepting of it. If you're writing something that is of a more, I don't know, factual nature, then people may be far more critical. But when you get into the realm of science fiction, you know, people kind of relax a little bit, and it gives you an opportunity to tell these stories. So, for example, you mentioned Star Trek. You go back, especially with those original episodes, that gave them the freedom to deal with all types of social issues that perhaps had they done, you know, a more factual-based, a more uh, 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 reality-based type of series, a lot of those storylines probably couldn't have come, you know, to uh, fruition. So by taking it to the science fiction realm, you're able to deal with these topics, you're able to use things like symbolism, allegory, and so forth to tell, to tell so many different stories. And the reason why this is important is because when you're reading these stories, now you are being uh, triggered to think about certain things, to see the world in a certain type of way, to question your place in it, and also to question what the future will look like. So it's also like a breeding ground for great conversation and thought. 
So bear in mind then how our history has shaped our future. I mean, our current, uh, well, the history, the people who are visionaries in our historical period were quote unquote futurists because they have to create the pathways, right? They foresaw that they could have a time without segregation. They foresaw that we could have a time where, um, you know, a black person could be president, for example. I mean, surely Chisholm certainly was ahead of her time in running for president. Um, as you think about 2030, and we think about the current uh, issues in inequality, the current sense that, um, you know, the next generation is not going to be able to be get ahead, and that's both for white and black America, right? Because there is a contraction of the economy. Um, how then do you feel that a, a, a network of artists and writers like yours can be more intentional about crafting, helping to create spaces or curate spaces where a conversation about how African Americans, Black America might survive and thrive yeah. in the common reality. Well, there's two ways to look at it. One, when you talk about economics, keep in mind when you talk about these writers and these creators, these are business people, these are entrepreneurs. So That's they are creating opportunities for themselves and when these companies become successful they can in turn hire other people and kind of keep that going so in terms of the real world you know one aspect that we can't forget about is the economic component we have these entrepreneurs that can perhaps change the future you know uh, from what you just described yeah i want to jump right in right there because one of the issues that we're dealing with is this idea that unemployment is probably going to be high right formal unemployment we're talking about ai being ubiquitous we're talking about um, all the studies show that with automation and artificial intelligence, a lot less jobs are going to be created than jobs are, that are lost. Now, um, we've heard about the number of black children being born or going through college right now. Where are they going to work? So as you think about this, I like this idea. So if we say that we have a, a group of entrepreneurs who are writing and possibly doing comic books, and we see this current surge that in comic book years. Um, how then you think Black America might be engaged in the entertainment sector? Because you know, where do you see us going then in that sector by 2030? Will there be a much more thriving? Is there room and financing available for a much more thriving? entertainment media space around which you know blacks can become employed and earn a living well you look at for example today you know present time you have the film get out you know which is just saw i think it's got like four oscar nominations so hollywood recognized that film small film small budget went on to be one of the most successful if not the most successful film of last year so that in turn will allow other black filmmakers with similar vision to perhaps get their stories told. You look at the excitement around the Black Panther film. Now the Black Panther character was not created by black folks. But when you look at, you know, with the film being made, there's a black director behind it, okay? There are black creators behind the making of the movie. There's, I believe it's like 90% in terms of black actors and actresses. And right now it looks like it's gonna be a huge success uh, in terms of ticket sales. So that will in turn, once again, Hollywood pays attention, they're gonna say, hey, there's a market for this. And once it's a global hit, you know, one of, the, one of the things, one of the myths has been that the image of black people don't sell overseas. So once this film has proven itself to be a hit all around the world, then that will give other opportunity to these young black filmmakers, to these black characters, these black writers and so forth, to get their stories out. And then when we bring it to the smaller screen, you know, you look at Netflix and how much they've invested in the black voice, in the black story. So I think moving forward, you're going to see perhaps more black entertainment, okay? And you're also going to see, hopefully, more black people behind the scenes, more black people in control of it. Because one of the big things that I'm about is controlling that image because that is so important. Because for far too long, we've had black film, but we didn't always have the black voice behind it. We had perhaps white writers, white, uh, uh, white directors, kind of, you know, giving their voice to their perceptions of black people. And they go all the way around the world. But if we can get more and more black folks on the creative side, you know, that becomes important along with this idea of increasing of 
black presence in the entertainment uh, industry. Do you think that, um, as you talk about the image, do you think that the narrative around the shuffling, lazy, welfare, mother, gun toting type characters, do you think that that narrative is so entrenched that removing it, just lodging it as the, as the default, you know, <laughs> Right, right, right. That's the fall position. I mean, do how much do you think has to be done in terms of balancing out that? I mean, that question may be a little bit flawed, yeah. but you, you, you cannot well, go well, away. Well, I think it's going to take a lot to really do away with that image. Uh, I think that uh, you can argue that Barack Obama's presidency went a long way in changing that image, but it still resonates. It's still very easy you know, for film creators, for writers to kind of fall back on those stereotypes when they need to. But we're seeing greater diversity in terms of the representation of black folk on the screen. So I think that if we continue in the current direction that we're going, you will start to see less and less of that image. Because I think now there are more black folks that are saying, hey, we don't have to, you know, uh, take the first script that's given to us. You know, if I'm an actor, if we're black viewers, we recognize there's a wider variety to watch. We don't have to just be kind of encapsulated by this stereotype of the pimp, of the drug dealer, of uh, uh, the welfare mom and so forth. You know, I mean, we have other archetypes that are popular. We have the, the mm -hmm. mommy archetype. Yes. We have, the, we have the, the preacher archetype. That's very common. We yes. have the fat girl trying to be sexy archetype. I mean, so, so I, I guess that as we think about image and media, and we think about what I'm looking at in terms of social justice issues mm -hmm. and, and power, right? Mm -hmm. How do we, and then, so you have the comic book characters who have power. How do we move from the comic book fantasy five type of power character for a power that is more um, embodied in who we actually have to be right. to live, you know what I mean? To live our yeah. regular lives. Yeah. Well, I think those, those films are important because it kind of, you can argue that mentally it sets the stage for us. It puts us in a certain position to see ourselves on screen, and then that allows us to have those conversations. For example, there are on, uh, there's only the, maybe the second or third episode now of this new series called Black Lightning. And in the first episode, he's already dealt with police brutality, intimidation, you know, in the first episode. And now he's this heroic figure fighting against that. We saw with the Luke Cage series on Netflix, where he dealt with, you know, uh, uh, once again, police brutality, uh, dealing with gentrification, you know, dealing with all these different issues, racism, classism, all those things came up. And these were, sh and these were shows about superheroes, you know, and people that started to talk about the show, this also forces them to deal with those issues because you can't enjoy the show without talking about those issues because that's what the show's about. Well, what is interesting then is that the fact that with so many platforms, before you only had two or three channels, so we would all know what's going on. I mean, I had never heard about that before. So if this movement, which I think you're saying is emerging, it's kind of underground still, but emerging. If this movement is going to be able to help address some of the current situations that we can then set our intentions to create a different future, how are we going to benefit from the existing media spaces we have? Or how can the existing black media spaces be much more um, responsive? Yeah. to your issues and to getting your messages out. How have, have you been having good traction with the traditional standard, I would say, black media houses? Well, uh, one of the things that I find that is happening is I'm using Afrofuturism, comic books, and so on and so forth as a teaching tool. And this has allowed me to actually get into classrooms. This has actually allowed me to talk to students where I can bring up these issues that you're talking about and also just bringing up history. You know, because I think that for a lot of people, uh, whether they're young or old or whatever, the traditional ways of learning is changing. And you have to find ways to captivate your audience, to 
to bring them into, you know, the story, to bring them where you want them to be, and then you can start to have that dialogue. And I think this type of uh, medium causes that to happen. You know, so for example, you know, I've written a book on the subject of black superheroes, and I've analyzed them. And I use that as an opportunity to talk about the civil rights movement. I use that as an opportunity to talk about the history of slave rebellion. I use that as an opportunity to talk about the objectification of black women, but I'm using, you know, Storm from the X-Men. I'm using Papa Midnight. I'm using the Black Panther. I'm using Luke Cage to get across this information to readers. And the feedback that I've gotten is that they've learned a lot, not only about comic books, but they've also learned a lot about history itself. So I think that's the way that, you know, that I see that this can be used to educate and to move it forward. Well, um, I'm glad you're saying that because, I mean, we do have to stand in our history in order to create the future. I'm very much, as a futurist, I'm very focused on the intentional shaping of the future. But as they say, Sankofa, you must go back and fetch what you left in order to, to go forward. So as you think about that and you think about the work you're trying to do, right? And yeah. the fact that we know we don't want more of what's wrong. We don't right. want more poverty. We don't want more um, crime in our neighborhoods and murders and shooting. We don't want more inequality. And even if we're not going to get less, we would at least like to have it stay the same. Certainly not yeah. in other words. What are some of the issues that concern you? Or what would you say concerns you the most as you think about 2030? You're fairly young. You'll still be young in 2030. That's only 12 years away. When you think about the year 2030 and the Afrofuturism Network, what are you seeing as what you're doing? What are you actually doing? How, what have you succeeded in making happen because you exist? Okay, well, one of the first things that we had done was we had actually held a comic book convention. We brought out these young creators, we brought out these creators, independent comic book artists and so forth, you know, to a place where they could sell uh, their creation. So this, for me, was building an, an economy for these young people. Now, there are all types of conventions like this and so forth. I'm certainly not the first one to do it, but I am contributing, you know, to that growing economic uh, uh, circle of creators. So that's one of the things that I've accomplished. And like I said, the other thing that I've done uh, through my writings and through my presentation, I know that I've educated educators. I just did uh, a couple of weeks ago, you know, I went to a, uh, an event where I was teaching teachers how to use these images in the classroom as a means ah. to teach and motivate students. So these are the things so far that I've been successful at. And recently I just um, contributed and invested in a young filmmaker by the name of um, uh, Chad, Chad, uh, Chad Eric, and he created this film called Rumination. And right now, you know, it's an independent film, it's a short film, he's having great success with, uh, with these different, uh, 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 what do they call them? These independent, like, Sundance uh, festivals. These film festivals. They're having great success there. So that's my way of contributing back and assisting, you know, the next generation of filmmakers and creators. So, uh, so you're saying then, and I'm, I'm interpreting what you just said, that in 2030, you would have probably been, um, you'd probably be putting on your, what, 10th annual convention or your, what? Yeah, 30th annual convention. And your convention will be how many people in 2030? Well, hopefully it'll be thousands of more thousands. It'll be just as big as anything that you've seen in California. You know, but you got to start small. You got to build up. No, give me a number because part of the whole issue of trying to create a fusion and intention, especially someone in your space, your narrative has to be clear. So if your yeah. first convention was 100 people, you want to yeah. say in 2030 our convention is going to be 5,000 people, right? Right. We're going to have, you know, 200 vendors, yeah. right? And we are going to actually have a film festival. That is correct. That is correct. <laughs> and we you called it. That's, that's what's going to happen. <laughs> I called it. So as you think about this whole, I mean, the good thing is you say about speculative fiction and science fiction and fantasy fiction is that it is limitless, right? Yeah. There's yeah. nobody that can put boundaries on our minds. And that our minds have been what, allowed somebody like Marcus Garvey to conceive long before the telephone and those things of the concept of, you know, a network. And he actually did purchase three ships. Nobody has done that 
in Saint Saint, right? So where did that come from? He probably was a fantasy fiction writer, <laughs> masquerading as an activist. So you think about the future of the American dream and the kind of stories as we come to a close. Would you say that you're optimistic, pessimistic, or neutralistic about the shape of the community? By that, I mean the shape of the Afrofuturist artist slash writer slash, you know, community. Well, as far as the whole Afrofuturist movement goes, one of the important things that we have to remember is we have to maintain control of it. Because far too often, black folk have created things, we've lost control of it, then it gets repackaged and sold back to us, and it loses original intent. You look at hip hop, you look at the black exploitation era, you look at jazz, you look at rock and roll. These are things that black folks created, you know, that we lost, gets repackaged, and in many instances, if there was a political message, if there was a, a message of hope or economics and so forth, many times that is taken out of it and then fed back to it. So the first thing we have to do is make sure that we maintain control over this. How do we do that? Those that are uh, buying these things, make sure you're supporting these artists. Make sure you're supporting these writers, these filmmakers. Because if we don't, then folks that may not have our best interests at heart will come in, offer these men and women, you know, large sums of money, and at some point, they're going to cave. I mean, it's only natural. They have to survive. They have to live. And then once they start to do that and they sell off what they've created, then we start that cycle all over again of folks coming in, taking what we create, repackaging it, and selling it back to us. So just as far as the Afrofuturist movement goes, that's the main thing that we do have to keep in mind. I'm very optimistic about it because, once again, I'm seeing some great things coming from it, seeing, seeing some great things being created. I'm seeing more and more people interested in what it's about. I'm meeting more and more authors that are tackling the subject, more filmmakers that are tackling the subject. So I'm optimistic about it, but we do have to remember, you know, we got to circle the wagons around this movement and not lose it. Okay, now to the larger uh, picture, you, you asked about just like the black community as a whole. Uh -huh. um, I would say cautiously optimistic. I don't, you know, maybe that's the best way to describe it. Yes. Because for all the great things that I can see happening, and all in, in, in directions that we're moving in, there's always, you know, cause for concern because I, I still see things within our communities that are troubling. I'm seeing things that have changed so much from when I was younger, just in yes. terms of when we interact and treat one another, that that gives me great concern. I think we've lost a lot in terms of community. We've lost a lot in terms of just how to talk to one another. You know, things that we can control. This doesn't take money. It doesn't take a great, you know, uh, some, you know, college education. Just being able to be respectful of each other, being able to respect the right to disagree with one another. You know, those are the things that I feel like if we're not careful, we're going to lose that. And if we lose that, then all the other things that we're doing and all the great progress we're making, we're making really won't matter anymore. Well, that's a very good place to kind of um, end. I want to thank you so much for taking the time uh, to, 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 to discuss with us about your idea uh, of what the Afrofuturist movement could emerge into and what, therefore, Blacks in America could expect for the year 2030. Thank you, William. Thank you. Thank you. So, folks, we have been speaking with William Jones, who is the founder of the Afrofuturist Network. I definitely want you to check that out. That's it, folks. I want to thank you for joining us on the Futures Firm Live, where we explore sage ideas for sustainable futures. Remember, the future is embedded in the landscape of today. And if you're, actually, if you're an Afrofuturist writer, you're actually shaping a narrative of the future that we will inherit. So, seize the future, seize the day. And as we say in Jamaica, walk good, safe journey. have been listening to the Futures Forum Live online. This podcast aims to tell and share stories about the emerging future and help us better shape the future we want. The Futures Forum Live online is a production of the Futures Forum in Washington, D.C. For more information, visit www.thefuturesforum.org. Get Future Sense now. 
Remember, our future is embedded in the landscape of the present. Share this story and share the future.